Hello everyone. Today we are going to talk about our forests and our oceans. So we just got through talking about commercial agriculture and how important that is to how much of the food that we eat. Um, however, some of this awesome commercial agriculture stuff in, up to and including our fancy schmancy green revolution technology it also has a not so great effect on our forests and our oceans, so we're going to check that out. So let's talk about the forests. Let us speak for the trees. Forests cover 30% of the Earth's land surface, and we consume a lot of the Earth's land surface in the form of wood. Um, we consume approximately 3.5 billion tons of wood per year. That is about 7 trillion pounds, as the crow flies. It's a lot of wood! So what is it that we're actually using it for? We are using some of it, um, half of it, for industrial timber. It's going down. We're using timber. And that includes construction products, lumber, and plywood as well as pulp and paper products. And particle board, which is probably what your desk and my desk are currently made out of. The other 50% is used for cooking fuel, um, and this is predominantly in developing countries that uh, do not necessarily have the benefits of um, either electric or natural gas to use their stoves. So they still use wood stoves um, as part of their cooking, mechanisms um, and therefore need 50% of that 3.5 billion tons uh, in order to cook their food. So where are these forests located? Um, if we're going by country, or at least as of 10 years ago, the most forests in terms of um, hectares, um, Russia has the greatest amount of forests, at least as of 10 years ago, followed by Brazil. Um, then we have Canada and the U.S., um, followed by China, then Australia, then the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, but one of the uh, key sort of issues that we're looking at in terms of forests and problems with our forests tend to come from Brazil in particular, because Brazil um, has our world famous, literally, Amazon rainforest, which is not only a source of lumber, but it is also a source of a significant chunk of the Earth's biodiversity. So if we lose the forests in the Amazon especially, um, then we are not going to do so great in terms of biodiversity, having habitats for all sorts of cute and not so cute creatures. So what's going on in our forests? Now, oftentimes when, when you hear that we're talking about the forests, you would basically think, well, we're definitely going to have a conversation about how we are losing forests. We're going to talk about deforestation. It's going to get very depressing. But there is a very, very bright spot. The temperate forests in our world are increasing in area. So in the U.S. and Canada and Western Europe, we are actually... Uh, replanting trees. So that's good. Good job there, little Groot. On the other hand, in tropical rainforests, or just tropical forests in general, those are the ones that are decreasing in area. So specifically, the Amazon, the Congo, and Southeast Asia, we are losing our forests there. It should come as no coincidence that our temperate forests um, the folks that are taking part in reforestation efforts uh, tend to be from the developed world, and the forests that we're losing happen to be in the developing world. As we moved from primary economic activities in the developed world to more sort of tertiary, quaternary, and quinary economic activities, we outsourced a lot of our primary economic activity type stuff, the gathering and harvesting of resources, to the periphery, which means that those are going to be the places that source our materials, which means those are going to be the places that are going to experience the most losses. So here's what I want us to do. Um, I might have either printed this out on a sheet of paper or put this 
on the board. Um, but at this point in time, I would like for you to pause this video and visit that exact website, um, youtube.com slash all of that, and uh, pause this video now and watch that video. What you are going to see is a time-lapse uh, video of the actual deforestation that is going on in the Amazon. It is a um, it is a researcher that took satellite imagery of the Amazon over the course of 10 years and you can see how much of the forest is lost in a 10 year period. Um, the forests in the Amazon specifically are um, being lost due to uh, soybean plantations. Um, we have an increased demand for soy um, and the Amazon region is very very good at growing that kind of stuff. So we're cutting down a lot of the trees to plant soybeans which is good for feeding people but not so much for you know the rest of the awesome things that our forests do. So pause the video, go to that YouTube website, I'll wait. Alright, awesome. Cool. Hope you enjoyed that video. Or rather, you know, didn't enjoy it and got slightly depressed. So, um, we are seeing that developing countries, uh, not the developed, but the developing countries are losing about 2% of forests every year. Um, and as you saw in that video just now, eh, it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty drastic. Um, we're going to see sort of like very, very small chunks of protected areas amidst vast, vast development, which is not necessarily ideal. Why is it that we are cutting down so many trees? This is, uh. um, first, we have shifting cultivation, which you might recognize from your FRQ that you just did and did so wonderfully on. Um, shifting cultivation is also known as slash and burn agriculture. So literally, one of the primary reasons for deforestation is because of something that is literally called slash and burn. Surprise, surprise. Um, another reason for deforestation is due to commercial purposes. So developing land and converting land from forest to agriculture in the case of Brazil, as we just saw for soybean plantations, and Indonesia, um, which is clearing down land for palm oil production. Um, also, we use wood for pulp, um, which is paper, um, and lumber products, so just regular commercial uh, lumber purposes. Also, it's not so much that we need the actual trees or we need the actual land, but we might also need the resources that are found underneath that land in the form of metals, minerals, and oil. And overall, there is also poor government management. So not every country um, has something to the effect of like an environmental protection agency, or if they do, it might not be necessarily the best run. Um, and the regulations in a lot of countries in terms of environmental impacts are a lot more lax than uh, countries in the developed world, which makes sense because if you are going to, for example, be an awesome massive corporation that is... Uh, a massive corporation that does commercial lumber, um, you are going to basically want to try and find the country that will give you the least amount of hassle um, in terms of environmental regulations. It's going to be a lot cheaper in those places, and those countries might be more likely to throw you land and a bunch of money in exchange for you investing in their particular country. So sometimes it's in a country's best interest to be slightly lax um, in environmental regulation, so government management, or lack thereof, um, could partially be to blame for a lot of this going unchecked. So, um, one of these, uh, this video, we're gonna do this again, hopefully it worked the first time, um, so this video is an explanation from Philippe Cousteau, you might recognize the name from, um, famous ocean explorer Jacques Cousteau, um, I believe it might be um, his son or his grandson Philippe, who is a, now a CNN correspondent, he is going to briefly talk to us about deforestation, what it is, where it's happening, why it's happening, um, and uh, the reasons why 
deforestation is so drastic. So go ahead, go to that exact website, pause the video, and come back and see me. Go on. I'll wait. I'll be, I'll, I'll be right here. Cool. So this is how drastic it's become. About 10,000 years ago, we had 6 billion, with a B, acres of tropical rainforests. In 1950, that number was basically cut in half at 2.8 billion acres. And nowadays, we have less than 1.5 billion acres left. If we keep going on the same pattern that we're going to, we are not going to have any tropical forests left in 30 years. That's your lifetime. And hopefully my lifetime. That's... It's not good. It's not good. So you've already seen some examples of tropical rainforest destruction. It's not a very, very pretty sight. Um, and the environmental consequences are not exactly as pretty either. So the environmental consequences of this deforestation type stuff is we have an increase in global warming and CO2 emissions. As um, Philippe, I believe, mentioned, or as um, the first researcher mentioned, the trees are basically the lungs of the world. They keep in, you know, they take in CO2, they breathe out oxygen. Us humans, pretty big fans of oxygen. We need that. Um, and when we get into human impacts on the environment, we'll explain exactly uh, what global warming entails. Um, but suffice it to say that the more CO2 there is in the air, um, the more we experience what is known as the greenhouse effect, which makes the earth a lot toastier, which could have some devastating consequences on down the line. Not cool. We need trees. Every day, about 80,000 acres of forest disappear, and that is a lot, and that is drastic. Um, and another reason that we need forests is because they help us sort of maintain this beautiful thing called the ozone layer, which we will also get into when we run into human impacts on the environment. Um, but suffice it to say, you know, we wear sunscreen, or at least we're supposed to, wear a sunscreen to protect us from the sun. The ozone layer is basically just one big old layer of sunscreen that's protecting us, and unfortunately, due to global warming, CO2 emissions, etc., 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 we are depleting that special protective layer, um, and um, if we have no ozone, we're probably going to end up roasting, and that's not cool. We need trees. Now, even as much as there's like that little, little tiny silver lining from our uh, temperate reforestation efforts. Unfortunately, the tropical rainforest rates of deforestation are so high that it's not entirely possible for our reforestation efforts in temperate zones to sort of catch up with the amount of tropical deforestation that's going on. So it doesn't really see a lot of signs of slowing anytime soon. So as we can see, where deforestation as has been a lot more drastic has been in South America. Um, we have actually seen decreases in Africa, Central America, um, and North America, but the increases in tropical deforestation are in Asia and South America, once again, because of um, things like palm oil production in Southeast Asia, and then soybean plantations in South America. So it's on the uptick. Now let's turn our attention to the oceans. You know, because we weren't depressed before, let's go ahead and look at the oceans where things are even just as, if not more, drastic. Yay! Um, so let's look at our world fisheries. About 87% of commercial fish, fish catches are from our oceans. So we did see some aquaculture happening. I imagine that that is what makes up um, the other 13% of our commercial fish. Now, even though aquaculture is a thing that we have going, uh, predominantly um, the fish that we eat comes from our oceans. In 1950, we had about 2 million tons of fish caught. In 1989, we had a, that upgraded to 100 million tons, what we call um, population explosion, and all of us really, really liking ourselves some fish. Um, and 
Point is, we like fish, and we are increasingly becoming a fish-happy group of folks on this planet. Um, and unfortunately, we have some issues in our oceans that need to be addressed. Uh, the first one is that at some point, if we're not too careful, we're gonna run out of fish. Um, sometimes we overfish, and it's not incredibly sustainable. Another issue is that um, due to uh, things like pollution, um, runoff into our waters, uh, we have what are known as dead zones, where we have low levels of dissolved oxygen. If there isn't enough oxygen in the water, fish can't breathe, and fish die. And so um, fish are basically losing their habitats to these places. Um, these dead zones, um, these low levels of dissolved oxygen, are a condition also known as hypoxia. Our coral reefs are pretty important. Um, if we have a significant amount of dead zones or human activity messing with our coral reefs um, or things like pollution, runoff, etc., um, messing with our coral reefs, and that is going to drastically affect um, the kinds of biodiversity that we have in our ocean. So coral reefs are important and are also affected. So as of the year 2007, about 28% of monitored stocks, um, by monitored stocks we mean that the United Nations has a special subcommittee that kind of keeps watch on certain sections of our ocean. So when they looked in 2007, um, the stocks that they were monitoring, the areas of, of commercial fishing that they were monitoring, 28% of those were overexploited, depleted, or recovering from depletion. And 52% of those were fully exploited. And by fully exploited, we mean that they produce catches at or close to maximum sustainable limits with no room for expansion. So you're basically either hitting the limit or getting very, very close to it, which means that fish aren't necessarily being replaced at a sustainable rate. So this is pretty drastic. Let's not, let's not run out of fish, um, even though, wow, by this chart, we are hella running out of fish. So this is the percent of decline of each of our species as of certain years. So the Western Atlantic bluefin tuna, as of the year 2000, has experienced a 98% decline in its population. The white marlin, 94%. The blue marlin, 80%. The big eye tuna, 72%. Very, very tasty. Very, very sad that we're losing it. Uh, the swordfish as well. Um, and large coastal sharks are experiencing a 50 to 80% decline. Um, so we are losing a significant amount of fish. And you might say to yourself, self, one of these things is not like the others. Like, okay, we get it. We probably eat these. Um, I know about sharks. Sharks are just scary. They are more than just scary. In fact, A, they're not as scary as you think they are. And B, we actually need sharks. We really do. Which is unfortunate because we are losing them and that's not cool. Now, here... Um, is a listing of different uh, kinds of sharks, different shark species. Hammerheads, the great white, the tiger shark, gray sharks, thresher sharks, blue sharks, mako sharks, and the oceanic white tip shark. Drastically, um, we see that mako sharks are at only 5% of their historic populations. That means that there are only 5% of mako sharks left that we've had historically. That is a really, really low, low number. Um, we're seeing hammerheads, um, uh, gray sharks are relatively okay, but they are still getting depleted, but the mako shark, that's one that we are absolutely losing. Um, the reason that the mako shark is so drastically high compared to everybody else's is because this is the most common shark that people actually eat. So, more than just being a byproduct of commercial fishing, which could be one reason that, that a lot of um, sharks are dying off, or um, sharks have this sort of reputation of being ridiculous, crazy killers, um, and so... People will often hunt sharks for those purposes um, and, and uh, recreationally fish 
for sharks. Um, but the mako shark itself, this is one that, that a lot of people um, in the New England region and in, in other places actually eat, which is why their number is so low compared to everybody else's. So here, let's take another moment to pause and um, watch this video. This video specifically talks about why it is that our sharks are so important. They are more than just scary. They do more than just eat people. Um, in fact, you are more likely to be harmed on your way to the beach than by a shark at the beach, by a mile. Um, so pause this video and then check out why it is that our sharks are important. I'll wait. Cool. Sharks are important. Um, so let's turn our attention to our coral reefs. Um, coral reefs are negatively impacted by global warming, urban runoff. Um, by urban runoff, we basically mean that um, as it rains, um, things like um, things that basically are on our roads, like oil from our cars or antifreeze, um, pesticides, um, herbicides, fertilizers that we might use in, in city areas um, are washed off and then basically end up in our water supply. Um, coral reefs are negatively impacted by bleaching, we'll get into what bleaching is in a second, um, as well as development. So as um, more and more people um, enter this earth, as, as populations rise, um, and humans in general definitely have a huge demand for living um, on or near the ocean. So there's more and more development happening along the coast, which means that some of these habitats might be getting removed and, and replaced with, you know, fancy man-made beaches, things like that. So that will also negatively affect our, our coral reefs. Here is a video that is looking at why it is that coral reefs are so important, how it is that we can help them out, and what are some of the issues befalling our coral reefs, and maybe, hopefully, let's see if there's a way to fix them. Um, so without further ado, pause and check out our coral reefs. Great, so here is a graphic um, from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, something like that. It's NOAA. <laughs> it's NOAA. These are the people that tell us about hurricanes and such. Um, they, they developed this infographic on coral bleaching. Um, it's not literally like it's, it's, you know, somebody's pouring, you know, Clorox into our oceans or anything. Um, but basically what happens in coral bleaching is that you have healthy coral, which contains algae, very, very small algae that lives inside the coral. And they have a symbiotic relationship, so they help each other out. Um, the algae provide uh, the coral its food, and um, they depend on each other to survive, and a lot of the color of coral is dependent on these algae. Now, if for whatever reason um, the area around the coral is subject to uh, pollution or change in ocean temperature, uh, maybe overexposure to sunlight and uh, potentially extremely low tides, um, the coral gets stressed out, much like we all are probably right this moment. So when the coral gets stressed, then the algae leaves the coral. So if the algae leaves the coral, then the coral loses its algae, therefore its color, and it is left bleach. Unfortunately, it doesn't lose just its color, it also loses its main food source in the form of the algae, so um, the coral then becomes way more susceptible to disease, um, which is very, very uncool. Now, where are coral reefs located? Um, these are basically, um, these areas in orange are places where your coral reefs can be found. Um, one of the most famous ones, of course, is the Great Barrier Reef here off the coast of Australia. Um, we have significant amounts here in the Caribbean as well as Central America, in the Pacific, um, but Southeast Asia as well 
and some off the coast of Africa here, and right smack in between Africa and Central Asia, as you will lovingly identify on your maps in a second. So, reefs are pretty widespread around the world, but unfortunately, due to all of the issues that we just discussed, we are potentially losing them at drastic, drastic rates. Due to things like coastal development, looking in your direction, Miami and Key Biscayne, and these are the kinds of issues that are caused um, due to sort of urban development um, as well as even things as seemingly innocuous um, as opening a beautiful piece of land up for tourist visits. Uh, this is a picture of Hanauma Bay in Hawaii. Gorgeous, gorgeous place. Um, a lot of um, movies were filmed there in the 50s and 60s. Um, and once... Um, it, it wasn't really a, a largely inhabited area by the indigenous population. Um, it doesn't have a lot of access to fresh water, um, but it was turned into a sort of protected zone uh, slash tourist attraction in the 1960s. It became very, very popular with film crews, but unfortunately, because of its popularity, um, a lot of tourists almost completely destroyed the bay, um, destroyed the fish, destroyed the wildlife. If you see here, these black sections of the bay are coral. And these beds of coral um, were damaged by people so much um, that, um, that unfortunately a significant amount of this coral ended up dying off. Uh, so I think what you're seeing a lot here are the kind of skeletons of coral, which is very, very dark and very, very morbid and very unfortunate. So over the course of about 20 years, you had millions and millions of tourists and film crews coming through the area and they nearly destroyed it. Nowadays, they have sort of changed it as of, I think, the uh, early to mid 90s they had policies in place in order to try and restore the bay as much as possible. So what they do is um, the bay itself is closed on Tuesdays um, and that basically means that no humans can walk in the bay for an entire day, for an entire like 24 hour period, which basically lets the kind of biodiversity of the bay breathe. Um, and in order to promote awareness of how to treat the bay, um, if you are visiting the bay for the very first time, you have to watch this long nine minute video um, before actually stepping foot into the bay. And the idea is to sort of educate you on proper things to do in the bay so as to not damage the biodiversity further. Some of you might ask, why don't they just close it down? Uh, because tourists. And tourists have money. <laughs> and money's good. So where is it that we are experiencing some of these dead zones and ocean pollution? Uh, maybe like situations much like Hanuma Bay. You see these all around the coast of the US here, all around like the East and Gulf Coast, um, especially situations in Europe where you have more persistent oxygen depletion. Here, it's a little bit more sort of periodic, either periodic or episodic or annual. So there are times when, you know, there is a significant oxygen supply left, but um, in Northern Europe, you still have a couple of areas like here, um, New Zealand. Um, you have areas where there is persistent um, ocean pollution and dead zones. Uncool. So let's zoom in a little bit further on the US and right here, right here in our Florida Keys, that's right here in number 14, um, we had um, some hypoxic events. Um, by hypoxia we mean low levels of dissolved oxygen. Um, these are a, a, you know, can be a result of natural events, but these are definitely accelerated by human intervention, um, by all of these being heavily populated areas, 
um, by having proximity to agricultural practices, um, which basically means that you have a large amount of like fertilizers and pesticides and herbicides running off into coastal waters. Um, in these areas, uh, temperatures in the water have been getting warmer and warmer. Um, and that doesn't necessarily help oxygen level matters. Um, so then there are lots of hypoxic events going on, mostly in the Gulf and Atlantic Oceans, and this is typically due to these kind of higher populations that we have in these areas. So, we will ask, um, all of these things are threats to our commercial fishing way of life, which, um, as we remember, is responsible for 87% of our commercial fishing. So why don't we up that presumably 13% that is aquaculture? Why don't we increase that? Does that make sense? And that's totally cool. However, um, there are some issues with aquaculture because, of course, um, you know, nothing is ever 100% good. Um, now, aquaculture... Um, a lot of times takes place in mangroves, and mangroves are currently being replaced by shrimp and fish farms. We really, really like ourselves some shrimp around here. What good do mangroves do? If you've ever visited a mangrove, you know, some of them, you know, it's not the most, you know, attractive place in the world. It's not the nicest smelling place in the world. So, whatever. Let's get rid of the mangroves. Let's like farm some fish, but mangroves do provide storm protection. They are basically nurseries for fish, so fish will lay their eggs um, in mangroves because it's a it's kind of a, a fish eat fish world out there, and mangroves are um, places where fish eggs and new baby fish are the safest. And they are also a bird habitat, presumably, because they are also fish nurseries. <laughs> and so, fish nurseries are very, very popular with the birds that will eat them. Um, so this becomes a really, really awesome habitat for baby fish and the birds that eat them, as well as protection from storms. So when you are removing mangroves in order to put in shrimp and fish farms, you are losing habitats, you are losing places for fish to develop and plant, uh, plant their eggs, etc. So, uncool. As you can see here, this is a shot of the mangroves in Honduras, in the Gulf of Fonseca in Honduras. Uh, this is the location of the mangroves as of January 6th, 1987, right? When we switch, we see how much of those mangroves have completely changed and have been turned into aquaculture farms. Um, so these are, these are shrimp farms in particular. So this is the before. There's the after. Before, after. So what are some other environmental risks of marine aquaculture? First, when you are taking out mangroves and you are making fish farms, a lot of the fish that you are introducing for farming purposes are non-native species, um, which completely throws habitats out of whack. Um, if those fish potentially escape, um, which ends up over here, um, then they will compete with the other actual local fish for not only habitat, but food. Um, and that's not necessarily a good sign. These fish are also, right, genetically modified. Da -da. Um, you can also genetically modify fish. And those fish, if they are genetically modified in such a way to be more uh, pest resistant, um, perhaps more predator resistant, then these kind of stronger superfish are probably going to take over areas um, that used to be devoted to local fish. And that is going to completely throw off the ecosystem. If 
you are in a farm and you're farming fish, if you remember the video that we saw where they were farming, I believe it was rainbow trout, um, that, that fish farming video, um, those fish were relatively highly packed together. And when you have fish, or basically a whole bunch of any animal really, in a very, very tight environment, you might have um, local diseases getting into those fish and then it spreads a lot faster through the population because everybody's so tightly packed together. And then whatever these non-native species might have, um, maybe some sort of like mite or parasite or something that, you know, might be relatively okay for these kind of fish, that is going to end up um, getting into the sort of other outside local habitat, which means that there are going to be new diseases and parasites introduced by these non-native species. Once again, completely throwing off the ecosystem. Um, these fish uh, can often be treated with antibiotics, hormones, anesthetics, um, pigments, or vitamins, which will then also leach into the uh, surrounding water supply. Um, the Use of herbicides um, is uh, herbicides are used in order to control algae growth on on you know basically on top of these on top of these nets, um, which is good for them, not necessarily good for the outside local fish. Um, and then this also kind of throws the ecosystem off in the sense that if you know without a fish farm, uh, predators have to work a little bit harder to get their fish in that local area. Um, if you have a bunch of fish basically in a barrel, it is going to become a very, very easy looking, tasty meal um, for surrounding predators. And so in order to protect, you know, the money which these fish make, in order to protect your money from these predators that are sort of circling and going, wow, this is a beautiful looking buffet, um, you have basically the sort of targeted hunting of these animals in order to prevent them from eating the commercial fish, which means that you have less of these folks flying around local habitats, which throws off the ecosystem. And then of course, let's talk about, you know, something that is not as fun to talk about, but everybody poops, um, and fish are no different. And Fish sewage, when you have this large concentration of fish, that means you have a large concentration of fish sewage, which um, is everything from food that these fish don't eat to fish waste products, as well as any diseases or pathogens that these particular fish might carry. And that, once again, completely throws off the ecosystem. So that is a look at our forests and oceans how it is that our commercial agriculture, whether it is commercial aquaculture, commercial fishing, or agriculture in and of itself, has an effect specifically on our trees and on our waterways. Um, when we come back, we are going to have a look at other wider human impacts on the overall environment.